Hey everyone, Depressed Eeyore here, and uh, this is Kingdom Death Monster. So this is not going to be part of any sort of campaign or anything like that. I uh, will be probably making a few videos here and there talking about some uh, specific mechanics about the game and, uh, you know, just general discussion stuff. Uh, this one will have some involvement with a future campaign, um, but I'll explain that when that comes up. You probably see a bunch of stuff on the board, don't really worry too much about it. Um, also, for those who have been watching my current series, um, there's definitely some changes onto the board. I've been implementing the expansions, don't worry about it. Because for right now, we're going to be talking about um, essentially alternatives uh, that the uh, game provides as far as rules variants and um, campaign variants. Um, some of the expansions kind of are their own variants as well. Um, for example, um, the Dragon King, uh, the Sunstalker, and uh, the Flower Knights each have their own sub-campaign uh, set of rules that you can use. Uh, Flower Knights pretty much just additional benefits and possible detriments, but uh, for uh, Sunstalker and Dragon King, uh, both of them have their own timeline and special rules and how it ends and things like that. But uh, this is going to be mostly focusing on the base game, as well as some additional content that the uh, creators provided on their website, which I'll go over in a bit. So let's first go over um, what the game has for us. So uh, this is towards the back of the, of the actual main book. I've zoomed it in as best as I can, so you guys can hopefully see it. And uh, we'll kind of go over some of this. In fact, I'm technically doing one of the variants already, which is solo play. But um, for the game variants, for the most part... Uh, <laughs> Even here, it just says you can just change the rules if um, you decided to use any, all, or none of these rules. Oh, okay, so let's just talk about these. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, so this game actually supports, you know, having your own variant rules for the most part. Uh, some of the things they've offered is five to six players. So instead of sending only four uh, survivors, you can have five or six survivors. And, um, uh, which sounds good, except for the fact that the monster gets much stronger as a result. And honestly, I don't think getting two additional... In the early game, having two additional survivors is actually a pretty significant detriment, in my opinion. It will uh, bolster the monster with plus two damage and plus one speed tokens. This is essentially, if you have an unarmored location, a white lion can one-shot your... Um, you can, can instantly severe pretty much all your hit locations, except for your waste. Um, and then the additional life trait, which is... Before you even can remove, start removing AI cards from the monster, you have to reduce its life to zero, and then you can start removing um, AI cards. And as far as it, in, despite it being much much harder, despite uh, you know only getting two additional survivors, the, uh, you don't get any additional awards. Um, it's, I mean, I guess if you get, if you manage to survive the initial <laughs> horror that is year one and year two hunts, uh, I guess it gets better. But to be honest, it's it's pretty harsh. Um, Simply because you just, you're not, I mean, one of the problems is, of course, you're going to have to have gear for those additional, those uh, fifth and sixth players, which is going to take a while. It takes a while to even get, you know, two to three people equipped. So these additional people really kind of just make it a whole lot harder. Anyway, uh, they've also added a quick mode where every all your survivors start with plus one strength, monster starts with more damage, and um, every time you, you wound the monster, you do double damage. And you die if you take three bleed tokens instead of five. So just a faster way of playing it. Um, to be honest, usually the combat's not the slowest part. I mean, the only time the combat's the slowest part is if you're learning about a new monster, in most cases. Um, there's usually not that much discussion. At least the times I've played it, there's not very too much discussion. There's usually some prior discussion about, hey, we're going to handle the monster this way. And then you just kind of go. Um, and a lot of the other discussion usually is during the settlement phase, not really during the combat. So, but it's there if you need it. Uh, hero mode. Now, hero mode is kind of the um, the nice, nicer version of the game. Um, in here, in hero mode, none of your survivors will die. They will simply just get uh, knocked out, knocked unconscious, and have to skip the next hunt. Now, they can still suffer severe injuries, and since these guys never died, these will gradually, you know, build up over and over again. Um, I did. I was. I did read someone's blog. I can't remember the name, unfortunately. Where they did a playthrough that was essentially seven swordsmen, which means they had this population of seven, and it never grew. 
But they made it hero mode, so they also never died. But it eventually got to the point where they got some of them got so many injuries or uh, disorders that they just couldn't function anymore, which is kind of interesting. Also, for hero mode, every time you name a survivor, you get plus one survival. Oh, sorry, you get the plus one survival as normal, but you also can choose to get plus one accuracy, evasion, strength, luck, or speed, which is kind of neat because that kind of gives you like a customization option. Um, personally, I usually pick luck because I like critting. Um, but yeah. And then there's death mode, which is as if, if you thought the game was too easy for some god-awful reason, you can make the game even harder. You can make it so all your gear is irreplaceable, which means every time you die, that survivor will lose all the gear. It gets archived instead of returned to storage. They die at three bleed tokens instead of five, and monsters get plus one damage tokens at the start of battles. So yeah, you die faster and you lose all your gear. So essentially you'll be kind of stuck at year one for quite a while, it seems like. And this is not even counting the, you know, the events that just kill your character off. So it's pretty rough. Uh, storyteller mode. Um, so this one, I kind of, it's a kind of way to implement a fifth player without having to, you know, do the five to six player rule. You just have one of them be a storyteller. This is something I usually volunteer to do um, when I'm trying to teach people this game because um, I like. I mean, I generally don't like DMing in general, but um, in in this case, I. I don't like DMing like things like Dungeons and Dragons, but I do love teaching people how to play board games and stuff like that, and teaching them mechanics and all that. So this is something I kind of volunteer to do a lot of times. Now the way this works is instead of having a monster controller, the story controller just controls the uh, the monster, and they can freely reorder the monster AI deck. So if the DM feels like being nice or harsh, they can definitely do that. Um, usually, if I do this, I never really reshuffle the I don't reorder the AI deck. Um, and technically right now, even when I do things where I'm more of like a, a referee, um, I still let the uh, players kind of control everything. I just handle the rules stuff. And, uh, let's see, the storyteller picks which settlement event is triggered in the settlement phase. So if you want to be a jerk, you can always say murder happens every year. Or plague. You know, plague's always good. Alright, uh, solo play. This is what I've been doing. Um, really, there's not, it's really just... Most of this is not even rules, it's just kind of like advice of trying to keep things organized. Um, the real only modification to the rules is you do not have a monster controller tile. Which is why, um, which is why I don't bother with monster controller, um, because there is, uh, I'm the only player. Um, for those who don't know, monster controller is, you take, the players are supposed to take turns controlling the monster. And if they purposely target their own character, it, you know, within the bounds of the AI card's rules and requirements, um, they will actually get insanity for targeting themselves because, you know, that's usually a pretty crazy thing to do is target your own character. Um, so that is kind of a limitation for solo play is I can't actually get, give myself insanity by purposely targeting targets. Now, granted, I could always just say there's a monster controller tile and just pass it around my characters. But for the sake of solo play, I kind of just went without it. Anyway, so let's keep going down here. All right, so that's pretty much all the rule variants that the game provides. Of course, that you can always toss in your own house rules like I do with um, Survival of the Fittest and things like that. I'll probably even make a video about some of the stuff about the intimacy tables and the problems with it. But uh, for right now, let's talk about custom campaigns. So, most of these are kind of like alterations to the actual way the campaign runs. Um, and there's not too many of them. I think there's only three. Yeah, there's only three. So there is uh, Seven Swordsmen. Uh, where you start with a population of seven. Each survivor has Ageless, which means they can, uh, or, yeah, they have the Ageless ability, which is what, um, well, I can't even, I can't say that without spoiling. So, each uh, survivor starts with Ageless. The way Ageless works is whenever you gain experience, you can choose not to gain it. You can also, I think it means you can also um, fight even while retired. So this is an option you have. Also, um, each survivor has Sword Weapon Mastery. So they automatically start with Mastery and Sword, which is pretty amazing, because that also means they're all specialized, and Sword specialization is pretty good. Um, for those who don't know, I can pull it up, actually. Let's pull that up. Specializations, don't mind some of the new cards, blah, blah, blah. Sword specialization is whenever you attack with a sword, after drawing hit locations, you make a wound attempt, and then you select a hit location. You do that once per attack. So that's pretty awesome. So if you roll a fail, you try to pick a, something that's a little less punishing for failure. And mastery, all mastery does is plus one accuracy, plus one strength, and plus one speed when, whenever you're using swords. 
Of course, I say that's all it does, but that's actually pretty amazing. That's, yeah, it's good. <laughs> Accuracy is not usually a big issue with swords, but I mean, with that, that just makes them even better. Um, and then, of course, is it also, yeah, strength and speed, so you get more attacks and more damage. All right. Uh, boop. And yeah, it's, but seven swordsmen, you do not uh, ever bother with people outside the settlement, so you can never gain population, and you can never do the intimacy because you'll never get, and so, because they have no love in their hearts. Now, this is actually kind of a detriment because not only can you get not get population, it also means you'll never trigger um, the um, the new life principle, which means you can never get survival of the fittest or um, uh, protect the young. Which, for the most part, the only thing you would really want them for, because you can't really breed, is you would want the plus one survival limit for um, survival of the fittest. Um, all right, so next is people of the skull. This one's actually pretty crazy. Uh, the people of the skull worship skulls above all else. Survivors can only place weapons and armor with a bone keyword in their gear grid. The people of the skull ignore the frail rule, which is good because majority of the bone weapons in this game have frail. So this means they don't break as easily. Uh, when you name a survivor, if they have the words bone or skull in their name, in addition to the plus one survival, they can choose to gain plus one accuracy, evasion, strength, luck, or speed. So kind of like the hero campaign, um, as long as you name your character after some sort of bone or skull, um, you would get a, a free stat increase. Also, during the development step of the settlement phase, survivors can use skull ritual or special endeavor. Now what this does is you spend a skull and one endeavor, you nominate up to four survivors, and they gain plus one, uh, permanent plus one to all their attributes, which is pretty crazy. Now granted, if you have your stats, stats too high, you can actually kind of hurt yourself pretty badly, so be aware of that. But it's pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, can only place weapons and ar armor with bone Q. Okay, I think you can still use accessories according to how this is reported. Um, also, the final little exception to the rules for the uh, bones is if you have the black skull, you can, if you make something using a black skull, you can add it to the gear grid, even if it's, despite the fact it's iron and not bone. Of course, getting a black skull is pretty difficult, so no worries there. And then the final one is the Twilight Knight in training, which is kind of what I've, I kind of, well, it's kind of what I go for go for in a lot of cases is you know you try to nurture a, a twilight knight to fight the last guy but in this case you actually start out with a twilight knight uh the twilight knight will start uh with a twilight sword gear and then gear grid and three weapon proficiency ranks and twilight not and twilight sword uh the twilight knight cannot gain age tokens can still hunt when retired never checks their uh, skip next hunt box and must always depart the Twilight Knight does not leave the settlement when they uh, reach max weapon, uh, max weapon proficiency with the, twi uh, with the Twilight Sword. If the Twilight Knight dies, the players lose. So essentially, you get a really, really good character, and you have to keep them alive. Um, the only issue I have with this is, of course, the random events, because the random events can and will kill your Twilight Knight. And you don't really have much control over that. I mean, the only thing you can possibly do is hope that... One, you never get plague, and if you do get plague, hope you don't roll uh, instant death for for the Twilight Knight. Um, if you get murder, you have to make sure you have someone that's equal experience, which means they have to have been with the Twilight Knight since the beginning of the game, or you have to have you know you know marrow hunger and all that nonsense. Um, and then there's of course all the hunt events that you know will murder your Twilight Knight. So. If I do something like this, I would probably make exceptions for like events because it it literally becomes just like a lottery essentially. Not because yeah, there's not really much control you have over it because you'll be like, okay, well, I got a hunt event, and this hunt event just killed my character, and I didn't really have any options to stop it because there's too many things, to, too many variables to keep track of. So yeah, it's kind of a mess. But I mean, starting with a Twilight Knight's pretty awesome though. All right, and yeah, that's pretty much all of the uh, custom campaigns and game variants. Um, some goofy ideas I've had in my uh, just just to mess around with this game is maybe doing one like I, I kind of just dubbed it Inheritance, where you, your four starting characters start with a random item, like a random gear from anything, which can range from anything from bandages to you know a lantern sword or something like that, just to see what sort of create it's. 
just to see what sort of crazy things you can get. Also, just in cases of like the Lantern Sword, it can also allow you to mess around with items that you generally don't get on most playthroughs unless you're very, very thorough and have a plan. Um, the other idea I, of course, had was, you know, having every character start with a f random fighting art, just to kind of give more variation there, because fighting arts are kind of cool, but you don't get them very often in most cases. Uh, some of the expansions kind of make up for this, but uh, it's just some ideas. I haven't really tried them out myself yet. All right, um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about... Um, how's my time right now? Eh, I'm doing okay. So let's talk about some of the um, additional stuff that the uh, uh, makers did. Now, they have a link on their website. It's just downloads book 319. Um, and it's essentially just a PDF that has a bunch of sub uh, extra scenarios. Uh, some of these are, I think all of these are based off just bonus characters that you can um, get figurines for, like Aya the Survivor and Candy and Cola and stuff like that. And uh, each of them kind of have their own requirements of when you can when and where you can do um, do these events or these scenarios. And if you su succeed, you'll have things happen. If you fail the scenario, it can potentially do bad things to you. Um, for the most part, they're interesting. Like there's a bunch of interesting things. You get to fight some variants of monsters that you otherwise wouldn't uh, ever encounter. It also introduces a bunch of new items that can be pretty crazy, like the giant stone face, which is a weapon. And if you have a roll of one, it becomes it becomes terrain, which is pretty crazy. Um, and some of them are like just like a mixture of various monster traits and abilities, which is rather neat. Um, a problem with most of these scenarios, though, is they're solo. Like they only have one survivor like doing things. Some of these range from a single survivor fighting a monster, which this game isn't really built for. Which is kind of weird. There's one where the boss, where the uh, survivor has to fight uh, three different monsters back to back, um, and yeah, they're kind of just a mess. And some of them, I don't know, they kind of feel weird, like the scout tunic, which looks like a hoodie. I mean, I don't really know how I feel about some of these. Um, there's of course the messenger of humanity who has to fight three, uh, four retinues by himself, and it's just, it's kind of weird. It's some of them are neat just to kind of read the stories and stuff involving them, but at the same time, I'm just like, okay, uh, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> essentially. But I will point out um, two scenarios that are actually pretty neat and actually are pretty helpful if you just want to make the game a little bit more viable or a little bit easier for you. Um, let's start with Candy and Cola. So the way Candy and Cola works, let me zoom in here. Candy and Cola you can do um, pretty much any time you want, uh, but it's recommended for years one through three. And the way this works is they find, uh, essentially they find Candy and Cola, which is the name of a character. And um, oh, I see, okay. So the, the, the set, this is, uh, the way this works is the settlement finds their, uh, the hunting party when you go out and, out and do a hunt. They find one of their own gravely injured, and then they get cornered by a, a young lion, and Candy Cola shows up to help out. Uh, the way this works is you would you would declare instead of fighting a normal white lion, you would decide to do the young this scenario instead. In which case, you still do a normal white lion setup, but you end up fighting a young lion which has seven movements and has a custom deck list and starts the ground fighting. Which for the most part, this line besides having a lot of wacky moves like luck wounds and uh, ground fighting only actually has nine cards as opposed to ten so it's actually slightly easier to fight um so yeah you end up fighting this white line and whenever you decide to do this one of the uh, survivors that you take with you is candy and cola um and so she will join you and candy and cola has starts with two survival plus one permanent movement and has hyperactive, which is a disorder where you have to move every round, no matter what. And starts with a founding stone cloth and a soda bottle lantern. And um, the soda bottle, the, co the cola bottle lantern, the way this thing, what this item does, is gives you plus one accuracy, and you can spend an action to give everyone plus one accuracy until end of round. You can only use it once per round. So this is like the ultimate support item because it. One of the things you always have trouble with in the beginning of the game is hitting your target. 
I mean, the second thing is, of course, wounding them, but hitting them is also pretty difficult in most cases because you only have, like, a 7 plus to hit. With a Cola Bottle Lancer, you can reduce that down to a 6 or something, or a 5 if you're using an axe, which is pretty pretty handy for um, fighting the early game stuff. Being able to hit on 4 plus in the blind spot with an axe is, uh, it's great. It's, <laughs> it's something you definitely want. Um, for the most part, the fight is practically the same. You, you just go through the hunt stuff. It's just the white line automatically starts with ground fighting and has a very specific deck, uh, deck list that revolves around uh, dragging people away and doing various moods and stuff like that. Now, the thing about this fight is usually if you lose against a white line, the white line will steal, steal a piece of uh, jewelry from your, uh, from your characters. If you lose in this one, though, you lose all your cloth. Which isn't that big of a deal, because cloth is pretty much kind of just there. But uh, it is a different defeat re uh, reaction if you um, if you fail it. Alright, enough rambling about that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, show you... So yeah, Candy and Cola is pretty good if you want to get a... One, you'll get plus one population, which is always good. You do get to keep... Can Candy and Cola does join you and hang out with you. If she Well, she'll join you if she's still alive at the end of the fight. Otherwise, you just get her... Um, Cola Bottle Lantern, which is a really good support item. Now the other event that's actually pretty fun, at least the, at least the do once, is Aya the Survivor. Uh, Aya is a pretty significant character because she's in the comic in the back of the main book. And um, essentially the story is about I, um, the, Aya losing her necklace um, because a screaming antelope stole it from her. And so this is a um, a scenario where she's trying to get that necklace back while avoiding the uh, Screaming Antelope. So this is actually a stealth mission, which is pretty interesting. Um, as you can see from the showdown setup board right here, it uses practically every piece of terrain that's in the main box that blocks visibility. So you got the Nightmare Trees, you got giant stone faces, you got some stone columns, and you have toppled pillars. All these block line of sight. Um, of course, the problem with this scenario is, of course, it's a solo scenario, which means if you're doing this with a group of friends, the either your group of friends are going to be telling you what to do, or they'll be sitting there waiting for you to finish the stealth mission, which can be either take forever or take a very short amount of time, depending on how you play it. Um, it's definitely very interesting because, you know, I, I consider this a good scenario to go ahead and show to your um, friends once. Because this is a very awesome tutorial on line of sight. This is all about blocking, uh, hiding behind things and blocking line of sight. So this is a great tutorial for field of view. Because field of view, you know, pretty much is everything except the blind spot. Unless there's things that can block visibility, like these items. So um, the way this works is this is not actually a hunt. This is just something you can declare um, do, to do during the settlement phase. And you just say, all right, I'm going to try this, and then you set up the board and go. Um, you can try it once per year, um, and if you fail it, there's actually no penalty for failure for this one. She, Aya just ends up getting chased away, and then you can just try again next year. Um, this is a very, very good scenario because it has a very good reward. Um, the only problem, of course, is the setting up the board and kind of getting all this situated and doing that every time you start a new campaign is actually rather tedious, especially since it's just a solo campaign. And if you're playing with friends, they're kind of just sitting around just waiting for you to get this done. Um, so what I recommend probably do, uh, to do, at least this is what I'll be doing probably in the future, is do it once, you know, get everyone familiar with it, how, how sneaking around items can be very useful. Do it once, succeed, of course, and then after you succeed once, never do it again and just get the reward every every time you start a new game. Because there's no point in doing it over and over again, because once you know the trick, it's pretty straightforward. Um, that being said, for this uh, for the this little video that you've been listening to me ramble on, I will be doing Eye of the Survivor sub-scenario, because it doesn't really need to be attached to anything. It's just a, its own standalone thing. Um, and if I succeed on this, I will apply the bonuses to the next playthrough. Um, Speaking of, the rewards for this is you get her spear and her sword, which I'll go over to, go over in a bit. But the other really useful thing that you get for this victory is getting her spear and the sword is an event. It's a settlement event. It actually replaces your random settlement event for that for that year. 
So you don't have to worry about, you know, rolling plague or rolling, uh, you know, skull eater for the 15th billionth time or rolling murder. Instead, you can be like, all right, I'm going to do this event, get my items, and then not worry about a random event that year. So essentially that makes, means that your year one and year two can be potentially, you know, death free as far as uh, settlement events are concerned. All right. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Oh wow, the monster goes first. That's some, that's some, that's awful. <laughs> All right, so the way this works is you set it up like this, and then you have these little markers that represent where the antelope goes. In this game, in this, um, there's no, there's no hit locations or AI cards to worry about. The only thing that you need to worry about is what the antelope does. It, it will either patrol or pursue. If at the start and end of uh, the antelope's turn, it will try check to see if it can get line of sight on Aya. If it does, it will trigger pursue, uh, pursue either that round or the round after. And if it doesn't, it will patrol. When it patrols, you'll be rolling a 1d5, and that's going to automatically move the antelope to that location. So if you roll a 5, you'll end up moving him down to this bottom left corner here. Um, now, if, if the antelope does spot Aya, it will instead do its full movement towards her, which will be like, I don't know, 8 movement or something like that, 6 or 8 movement, I don't remember which. Um, and that's about it. And if the antelope ever um, makes contact with um, Aya, that will end the battle. I believe that's how it works. Let's see. I'm trying to see what the requirements are. Yeah, there it is. Pursue full move the antelope directly towards Aya. If the greedy antelope reaches her, Aya is defeated. So that's something to be aware of. Um, now this works. Now the thing that you need to be aware of is if she. It'll pursue her on its next turn, even if she leaves the monster's field of view. So if you get spotted and then you go and hide, the monster will still head straight for you. Essentially, you have to make sure you get far enough away and hide somewhere where it can't see you, even though it's going to be charging through a bunch of terrain. Um, now what I has is, instead of a character sheet, she just has a few stats. She has hyperactive, which means she has to move every round. You can't just sit there. Uh, she has one survival, and she can dash. So she can spend that one survival point to dash to move twice, essentially. Um, she has her sword, her spear, and her lantern. Her sword she can use to manipulate the uh, the random uh, patrol result by one. So you can you know add one or minus one to the result. Um, the only thing I'm not entirely sure about this is whether or not you can loop around with this. Like if you roll a five, can you go all the way to a one? Or are you stuck with just a four? I'm not sure. Then you have um, Aya's spear. Uh, once during the showdown, Aya may hurl her spear up to six spaces away from her current location. On the monster's next turn, move the monster to that location instead of rolling a die. Roll as normal on the next turn. Now note, this is instead of rolling a die, which means if you, if it's currently pursuing you, that spear is not going to help you. It, this is only while it's patrolling. And then its final, uh, her final ability is she can take her lantern and extinguish it, and she will be out of the monster's field of view until she moves or until the end of the mo uh, the next monster turn. On Aya's next turn, she must relight her lantern and, and uh, does not gain activation. So it takes an activation to use this, and you'll loot. it takes an activation to, to relight it. So if you use this, you're going to be without an action for essentially that turn and the next turn. Pretty straightforward. And there's not really much to worry about this. Um, the, only th the goal for this is you start at E. That's where you start, and then you get to O to get the item, which is the monster tooth necklace, and then you go back to E. So you have to get to O and back without being um, caught by the antelope. So with that explained, let's uh, let's give this a shot. So the way I have the markers for the uh, positions is like this, and of course I can have the antelope start anywhere I want. Well, I can't, sorry, the antelope has to start here. This is M1, there's M2, M3, M4, and M5. That's the uh, item, the necklace that Aya is trying to get back. And here's Aya. Of course, I'm using Aya from Toho, but whatever. Now, the general idea for this is you're supposed to go around like the edge here.
just take advantage of this because there's all that blockade kind of going around like this. Sneaking around that and then get there and then go all the way back. But there's a few tricks you can do for this one. And I'm going to probably go ahead and try to do that and see what happens. Because there's a little secret you can do. Let's see if I can do it. So, monster goes first, which is something I was not aware of before. So let's go ahead and do it. So I have to roll 1d5. 2. So it's just going to end up appearing over here. And that is pretty much it for that. And then it is now Aya's turn. I have to move at least one space because of hyperactive. If you wanted to see what hyperactive is. During the showdown, you must move at least one space every round. So Aya has to move one space. Aya's movement is five, by the way, so we'll just keep that in mind. Um, now what I'm going to be doing is going to just do this for now. We're just going to kind of go back and forth. Now I do have to keep track of this because it's kind of annoying that way. Anyway, I'm trying to keep track of, um, yeah. So the, the way you can do this, of course, is just go around. In fact, it's probably faster at this point. So what I'm pretty much, I'm not going to move him right now, because what I'm trying to do is trying to get him back to one, which has not been useful. Uh, let's see if we have, this actually might be a little bit of a trouble. Yep, so now it has line of sight to me. <laughs> so... So it does have line of sight to me, so it's going to pursue me, which is not exactly what I wanted, but whatever. So one, two, three, four, five. And what the antelope's going to do is he's going to go one, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's actually going to reach me. That's actually super annoying. All right. Well, in that case, let's do this. All right. So, I'll do so what I was trying to do is get him to get back to one. Because that's what I want. But I ended up just not getting... I ended up getting him on a 5. Alright, I know how to do this now. Sorry about this, guys. I was kind of thrown off by the fact that he um, actually goes first. I thought he didn't. Alright. So, Antelope goes first. Goes to 2. Alright, so I'm just going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Go right here. I think that's fine. Let's take a look at the, uh, that there. Yep, that is fine. That does block line of sight. Pretty much you go center mass to center mass, and if it goes by any uh, of these terrains, it is blocked. Okay, so with that taken care of, which is good because that means pretty much that spot is safe, so I don't have to worry about it too much. All right, so now let's do this again. All right, now we can do this. So what this did is it put them right there. And what I can do here is go... One, two, three, four, five. That is within his blind spot, and this is safe. And then the next thing I can do is go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, like so. So yeah, what I can do for this turn is use IS Sword to manipulate where... Um... So there's a few things I can do. I can... I have an action right now. I can either hide or I could throw my spear. And I think I want to throw my spear. So with the spear I can throw I can throw it six spaces away. So I can make it just go that way. Alright, so where I have um, the ruler is I'm going to throw my spear there. And as long as, instead of rolling, it's going to go straight for that. Alright. So for its turn, it's actually going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Like so. 
It does have line of sight to me, so it's going to pursue me uh, next round. But that's completely fine because what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to spin the. I'm going to go ahead and spin that survival point. And go one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So the monster did see me last round, so it's going to pursue. So it's just, so it's going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. Doesn't have line of sight to me anymore, so I can it'll start patrolling again next round. Then I go here, which will just grab this, and that will be my turn. And now. It's going to go 4, which is right here, which is thankfully safe. Yep, block line of sight. Alright. So what I'm going to go ahead and do for this round. I have to move this round. So that's a problem. I should have what I should have used is I should have used my sword, but kind of late too late to do that. Two, three, four, five. So what I can do is get to here. And put out my torch. Which would buy me a turn, but it won't be enough to get, I won't be able to reach where I need to go. So I think for this round, I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, like so. And I will actually, yeah, I think this is fine. Let's see what happens. Of course, it was a one because this game hates me. So it's going to be right here. It's definitely going to see me. That is not what I wanted. Yeah, definitely line of sight. <laughs> so... One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, well, let's do this the hard way then. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, and light our torch, or put out our torch. So we're out of line of sight. It's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. Luckily it didn't reach us. And then we're gonna go One, two, three, four, five. And I have to spin an action to get back my torch. And then it goes back here because it doesn't have line of sight to me. And then I go one, two, three, four, five. Should be okay. Yeah, we're fine. Nothing can spot us from here. Four, which is right here. Just barely, barely clips that and barely clips that. So yeah, it's a it's a really neat little tutorial on stuff like that. One, two, three, four, five. I go here. I'm just going to go here. All right, I'm just going to hang out for now. Wow, can she make it? One, two, three, four, five. No, she can't. Okay. You're going to have to stop doing that. Thank you. Put you right there. I is going to go one, two, three, four, five. It should be okay. Alright, 
I'm going to go ahead and use the sort, which means I can add one or subtract one for my uh, the style result. So this will put her put it this guy here. I'm just going to add one to it and keep him there. All right, so she's used up her survival point, and I've used up all three of the items. So from here on, it's just movement. One, two, three, four, five. So four again. One, two, three, four, five. One over here. One, two, three, four, five. Three. Just right there. One, two, three, four, five. By the way, the starting point is right there. Uh, okay, you're fine. Five, which is right there. You just wait around, and then it moves here, and then I go here, and that's it. And that's how it works. A little bit sloppy start, because originally I thought I go first, in which case you can just do this, and then go down here, and then you can kind of just get your, you can pretty much get back this way if you have it set up right, but I didn't really have luck on my side, so it is what it is. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's nice to do once, but having to do that every freaking time is actually kind of annoying. Also, even though there is some RNG, once you know kind of how the mechanics work, there's really no point in having to redo it every freaking time. So that's why I'm going to be proposing that I just say I, I, I do this, but I say I succeed, so I don't have to do it every freaking time. It also saves you guys some trouble in future playthroughs, so you guys don't have to see it. I just wanted to show this to you guys once, and from now on, I'll probably just say that I do this event and get it done. Now, the reason why we want to do this event is not only does it cancel a settlement event, it gets you these two items. You get Aya Sword and Aya Spear. Both of them are 2 speed, 7 accuracy, 3 strength. So these things are about the same stats as a Lion Beast Guitar. The only thing they, these weapons don't have is they don't have Deadly. That's the only that's the only detriment. But what's really good about this thing is it's a sword and a spear, but they can be paired together. So having these two weapons together, not only do you get a red affinity, you get to add their speed together. So essentially you get a this is essentially line be a pair of Lion Beast guitars minus the Dudley. Um, and whenever you attack with them, you can either choose to get a sword or spear proficiency. So this means this is your kind of your guaranteed way of getting a spear uh, spear weapon that you can become proficient with without having to go through the trouble of getting a um, um, lion spear or whatever it is that's not that good. So, and this is uh, this is really good. This is a they're not frail, so they don't break. Um, you can, the only way I've lost these weapons is because of you know random events or because the antelope ate them. Um, but yeah, this is. For year one and year two, where you're struggling to get weapons, this is a really good thing to get. Also, if your year one just doesn't go well, you'll at least get these weapons when you come back. So, I definitely recommend doing this. I wouldn't recommend doing it every time. I would just recommend doing it once, showing it to your friends, and then being like, okay, from now on, we'll have the Aya show up event happen in, in year two. Because, very much like the... Um, the first day event that happens no matter what, so you can always just say that the Aya event happens on year two. Like I said, the only reason I'd say this is because this is very static, and once you know how this works, it's pretty easy. I kind of took the risky way, which is you know going from here and then going all the way down with a with a dash, but you can actually do it the slow way where you just go all over, all around the edge here and then go back the other way. So it is what it is. But uh, yeah, so I botched it the first time because I. I didn't realize that it was just going to appear there and get line of sight at the starting position. But, um, yeah. Kind of rambling at the moment. But uh, I think we're done here. So, that's, uh, yeah, that's just the stuff I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about the additional uh, rules variants and campaign variants, as well as just show a little bit of the challenge scenarios. There's a bunch of them. I really, the only ones I ever bother with is Candy and Cola and Aya the Survivor. 
I'm not going to be doing Candy and Cola because my playthroughs are all to are pure Toho, so I don't want to deal with Candy and Cola. Um, but I will, I happily will do Eye of the Survivor just to get some additional weapons to kind of give yourself a nice boost. One other thing I want to go ahead and point out is if you do lose this game a bunch, which technically you probably will, um, you actually have a selection in your um, settlement sheet that will keep track of how many uh, failed settlements you've gone through. And just like with the age, um, the age experience that you get, uh, you'll eventually hit little markers that will give you benefits or detriments for future um, battles. So once you get about five, four or five defeats, um, you will get to start with a survivor corpse on um, the uh, very first white lion fight. Um, and then if you get you know up to ten, you can get some skull basic resources and increase your survival limit by one. For the most part, I almost count successes and losses as part of this, just simply because eventually you kind of want to speed things up. But it, but eventually it gets to the point where stuff start, stuff becomes a little bit more dangerous. For example, all survivors get plus one accuracy, but the line gets stronger. And then the final one, of course, is it'll just start adding acid storms to the um, to the world. Which acid storms aren't bad, to be honest. Let's take a look at that real quick. Settlement event, acid storm. It's a bit dangerous, but it's not the. It's definitely not that bad. Also, you can potentially get acid palms, which is always good. All right. Well, enough rambling. I just wanted to go over you know the sub scenarios and as well and show off the Aya stealth mission, which is cool. It's a great idea, but it's also a solo mission, and this is a game where you're supposed to be playing with friends. So do it like I said many many times already. Do it once, and then just get the benefits for future playthroughs. You might as well. Game's hard enough as it. Alright, it's a press Dior, Kingdom Death Monster. See you guys later.